Hello, I do want a microphone. Okay. I can project, but I also love attention. Hello. Um, it is a dark and stormy night. You are here. Um, I'm Elizabeth. Welcome to Gibson's Bookstore. You are not here to see me. You are here to see Josh and perhaps Ryan, our queen of scream here. Um, we are very excited for this event. We, uh, we got this event because Ryan has no chill <laughs> on Twitter. And Ryan makes friends with very cool people. And sometimes that pans out into very cool events. So we are very pleased to have this event here tonight. Please join me in welcoming Josh Mallerman for Daphne. Thanks, Oh my God, hi Josh. Hey. <laughs> um, wait, before you start, okay. I, I think I want to tell you I came bearing gifts. <gasps> oh my Yay. God. So, <laughs> <laughs> I brought you oh, uh, a Sam Hatton <laughs> varsity jacket. Oh my God. There's only two of these in existence, the other one's in my office. I'm going to wear this the whole event. <laughs> <laughs> and I brought you a UK version of Daphne. <gasps> um, I like it because it's like big and the font's a little different. I like it. But uh, I think I may hold on to it during this. That's fair. In, 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 in case I have them anything up. But this is yours. Oh my I'm God. I'm holding your book. Well, That's amazing. Get our gifts on the way out. <laughs> <laughs> yes. This is actually really warm, so I'm going to take it off. Yeah, no problem, right? No, like a, like like a, a sound, really like good. a traveling sound. All right, hold on. Let's dramatically. Hang on. Oh, yeah. yeah. That. Okay. Oh, yeah. 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 But, um, so I had this revelation recently about how I became a fan of horror novels, because I feel like we all have that, like, that moment we became a fan of horror novels. Um, all right, so back up. I've been at Gibson's, can you all hear me, by the way? Okay, okay. so I've been at Gibson's for 10 years. Awesome. Um, I know, for 10 years. That's cool. How did that happen? <laughs> um, and, uh, but I was not always the queen of Scream, and if you knew me 10 years ago, I was the YA specialist. I was over there <coughs> recommending all of the books to teenagers um, and adults who read YA. And, um, but I've always been spooky, and I've always done my like 31 Nights of Halloween, and you know, I've always been into horror movies. And I had this coworker who we would chat horror all the time, and he came in one day, and this was like nine years ago, and he was like, he had this this arc of a of a horror novel that was coming out in like a year. He was like, okay, I just I just read this book, and I know it's not what you normally read, but I really need to talk to someone about it. So you have to read this. Like, oh, okay. So I brought it home and read it because when a bookseller tells you to read a book, you have to read the book. That's the rule. I'm making eye contact with all of you. <laughs> uh, so I read the book, and he was right. I loved it, and we we chatted about it, and we kind of began this thing where uh, we would read horror novels and, and it, it opened up this thing in my brain where I was like, oh my god, horror is a thing. I forgot horror was a thing. Oh, this is amazing. Right? And so like years go by and I read more and more horror and eventually I am affectionately dubbed the Queen of Scream uh, at Gibson's because I only read horror. <laughs> uh, and, and now I'm, you know, the person that people come in asking for and uh, my coworkers come find me even on break to be like, someone wants a spooky book, uh, help. Um, but what's fun, um, I, I found, I was organizing my books the other day and I found the arc that my coworker gave me all those years ago. Wow. <laughs> Anybody heard of Bird Box? Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. This was my horror awakening book. That's amazing. <laughs> That's amazing. But that, you know what's weird to me about that is that I've always felt like Bird. I, I felt like Bird Box was a straight shot. Like a, like every now and then I like to write what I would consider like a fastball, yeah. right? And I feel like Daphne is that as well. Yeah. A Bird Box felt like a straight down the middle. Like this is like just a straight black and white almost yeah. stor uh, horror story. And then my agent, the you know, uh, I got her with Bird Box. And she was like, this isn't really like a horror story, this is like a thriller, this or that. And I'm like, no, no, this is squarely horror, you know? But then 
uh, Harper Collins like presented it as like a thriller and this too in mm. sort of a way, and I'm like, no, 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 no. But then they're like, oh no, there's a wider audience. I'm like, eh, okay, but like uh, horror is home. Yeah. You know, I want to be in that, not, not in that scene, but in that realm or something. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. there's, I mean, there's very few uh, genres more passionate than horror. Like yeah, horror or more exciting, fans or more are, interesting, or more yeah. colorful. Yeah. Or more imaginative, or yeah. more elastic, yeah. or cooler. <laughs> and horror fans are just the best fans. We yeah. know this. this is just scientific fact. We know this. Um, okay, so let's talk about Daphne. Okay. Who who here has read it, by the way? No, I just started. No spoilers, I promise. No spoilers. I'm just curious. I know Jennifer's read it. I don't. Okay, okay, cool. Um, so let's do the no spoilery, give us the elevator pitch. Right, this is how it ends. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, okay, I know you're just asking like what the book's about, but it's interesting to me because I feel like it, with a lot of books and songs, um, it's like not the author's place to say what it's actually about. So with Bird Box, somebody might be like, is this about the madness of the world? And you look outside, I'm like, I don't know, what do you think? <laughs> but with Daphne, it is 100% about anxiety. Yeah. Like 100%. If someone said, is this about something else? I'd be like, no, 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 it's about anxiety. So. It's a seven foot denim clad mad woman ghost <laughs> who smells of the bar. I think I'm describing myself. <laughs> um, I knew who, she was who, who, uh, I really just realized that I'm Daphne. Uh, a little less murdery. And, and she's, uh, she has a predilection for the high school girls basketball team and she's going after them one by one. And so Kit Lamb, the star of the team, uh, or I don't know if she's the star, but she's on the team. And she uh, she uh, struggles with anxiety. And Daphne is essentially a panic attack. The more Kit thinks about her, the closer she gets, the bigger she gets, the closer she gets. And so that's that's the nuts and bolts of it. I feel like I need some water. Sometimes. Yeah, uh, right behind you okay. on the shelf. Um, yeah, and, and what's interesting about Daphne, and I uh, screamed at you about this right after I finished it, is that it's... So yes, it's about anxiety, but also like the the physical book itself, like the structure of the book is a panic attack and yeah. spirals. And how how conscious of that were you? That's what I mean the whole time. There was yeah. there was not there wasn't a sense of um again with Bird Box it was like, Oh, this should happen next and I don't know why and I don't care why it just feels right. This one was like, No, no, no. Now what happens next in this yeah. experience? Yeah. So Fully aware of that the whole time. Fully aware of the subtext the whole time. But there, but if, if, if that's what it actually is about, I guess it's not subtext, right? Yeah. Daphne is about anxiety, and Daphne yeah. is anxiety. Yeah. Yeah. And you struggle with anxiety. I mean. And I struggle with anxiety. I think yeah. a lot of us struggle with anxiety. So yeah. this is this is an important. Book. I feel like I see people like online that have it like way worse. Yeah. Like their description of it, I'm like, holy cow. But in a general sense, yeah. I mean, I was scared on the way here. You know what I mean? And like, I'm, I'm scared right now. <laughs> and, no, scary. but God, there's so much to say about this subject, isn't there? Yeah. That like for um, example, and something that's talked about in the afterward, uh, Allison is my fiance. And Allison, one time during a particularly rough patch, she asked me, she's like, have you ever tried timing one of these episodes? And I was like, timing one of these? Like, that sounds insane. Who's gonna like look at their watch during, you know? I'm like, oh, well, it's uh, 7.01 when I started freaking out. And it's 7.02 and it feels like an hour's gone by. <laughs> Great! Great, thanks, Allison. So I did, I timed an episode and it was about seven minutes. And like when it, like, you know, when it started to fade. And then the next one that came, I timed it and it was about seven minutes. The next one that came was about seven minutes. So, it's like the nature of um, the sufferer that you, just because, like, okay, I've never heard of somebody getting through one episode because they got through the last one. Right. No, you believe each one. Yeah. Like, this is the most scared I've ever been. Yeah. Right. But what Allison did was gave me this, like, numerical, like, value to it, mm -hmm. where I was like, I can get through seven minutes. Mm -hmm. And that changed everything for me. Isn't that awesome? I like that. Yeah, I still like thank her about it. And she doesn't, she's like the most fearless person I know. So I'll, and she's like, oh yeah, no, 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 no. Yeah, I feel like she doesn't even believe that I go through this. Because it's, because it's like invisible. I'm like, yeah, yeah. She's like, maybe. Prove it. Yeah, anyway, let's, we gotta do this. 
<laughs> she's full of good advice. She's the one who uh, taught me the thing about covering your ears during a scary yeah. scene. Yeah. And I do that all the time now. Do you guys know about this? Mm -hmm. So if you're watching a horror movie and there's something like gory or scary or something happening on the scene, cover your ears, not your eyes. Yeah, because we were watching The Nun and I saw, I was hiding behind Allison, <laughs> and she uh, she goes no 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 just plug your ears and I was like what the no and then I did it and I was like oh my god it's just a bunch of people in makeup jumping out at each other yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it it just takes Changed you out of it everything. just enough but that's I mean, that's also a um uh, what's the right phrase for that uh, underscore is how awesome the horror soundtrack oh, is yeah. and the horror sound design and all that yeah yeah um I'm totally gonna jump from that. Because you're a musician, would you would you ever consider doing like horror scoring? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know what that means, or <laughs> like if I was asked to do it, I'd be horrified. You know, I'd be like, I would say yes. Yeah. And then be like, oh my god, what do I do? You know, yeah. do I get my band together? Do I use a keyboard? What do I do? But I would yeah. love to do that though. Yeah. Yeah. I figure. I mean, if I ever direct a movie or something like that, I should I should just give it a go. And if it sucks, then get someone else or something. Yeah. Can Can I brag about your band for a minute? Yeah. Can we can we talk about your band for a minute? Okay. How, okay. So how many of you know Josh's band? Anyone? Like one person? Yeah. Okay. So this is this is gonna be fun. How many of you know the the show Shameless? Uh huh. Uh huh. You know the theme song to Shameless? That's me and my best friends. That's this guy. Yeah. That's this guy. Yeah. <laughs> uh yeah. And I discovered so it's called the High Strong. I discovered your band right after your new album came out, Hannah. And, um, oh, that really? Yeah. Oh, awesome. And went down a huge rabbit hole, and now it's all I listen to. So, <laughs> well, 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 thank you. <laughs> thank you for that. Some people are like, um, can't reckon, and I feel like you and I have a similar take on this or something, but some people can't reconcile the band is like upbeat. Yeah. Well, in a general sense. Yeah. Like poppier or something, and then writing horror novels. How do you reconcile these two together? And those people have not listened to the lyrics. <laughs> well, right, there's that, for sure. And then also, I feel like rock and roll and horror are coming from like a similar, like, like playful place. Yeah. Where it's like, it's almost like, I don't want to say childish, but it, there's like an arrested development about in horror that I cherish, or in myself, yeah. Yeah. that I cherish. Yeah. And, I, and it doesn't mean to say that I um, uh, am re refusing adulthood. It just means that I think through horror, I have found a way to carry childhood into adulthood. Because I believe it, for the duration of the movie, for the duration of the novel, for the duration of the scary soundtrack, I believe the experience. Mm -hmm. And like my, bro my older brother doesn't. You know, he, I mean, he might get scared by a loud yeah. sound or something. But I'm like, oh my God, this is happening. Mm -hmm. And that's like a kid's reaction to that. Mm -hmm. And so for me, that that's one of the, like beauties of horror and rock and roll is that playful, I don't, I don't wanna say childish. I gotta work on this a little bit more what I'm talking about, but somehow they're like, they're coming from the same exact spot to me. Yeah, it's it's almost an innocence, but like, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I I agree, I agree with that. Except for Jack Ketchum, everyone else is innocent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so I just, I just wanted to brag about that for a minute. Um, let's go back to Daphne. So we had a conversation right after I read Daphne, um, and you were telling me about this conversation you'd had with another author about how usually you'll go into a book and you'll have these kind of like landmark moments that you know you want to hit. Yeah. Um, and that you had this conversation where you were like, what if we just started at those? So Can we talk more about yeah, that? Yeah, it was with John Langan. So I, yeah. I called, I read The Fisherman, and I had never talked to him before, and I wrote him online. I'm like, can I, can I call you about this book? And he was like, yeah. And we talked for like an hour. It was amazing. I'm sure, Tony, you know him. Yeah. And some other people here know him. I'm like, God, what a dude. What a dude. And <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, but we were both talking about how we will start a book with like three or four like scares in mind. And then we'll like space them out in the book. And it's like, wait a minute. Why don't, and he told me with the fisherman, he was like, wait a minute. Why don't I just front load them and then have to come up with more scares, you know? And I was like, Right, that's the way. Why are we doing this? Like saving this moment for later on? No, yeah. let's let's try to one up ourselves all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and I think when you were on the podcast for Pearl, and you were like, oh, yeah, I am working on this. I'm working on this this short story or this novella, but I think they want me to make it a full novel. That was Daphne, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> my next book is called Spin a Black Yarn, and it's a 
collection of like novellas that take place in Sam Hatton. Awesome. And it opened with, I mean, this was in rudimentary stages. It opened with Daphne. Because again, I thought it'd be awesome to open with a fastball. Yeah. And then we can get as weird as we want. Yeah. <laughs> but then when I sent it in, the roughest of rough drafts, uh, Trisha at Del Rey was like, no, this should be our next novel. And I'm like, really? And then she sent a few um, ways or examples how that could be. And I was like, oh, shit. You can swear. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh shit, Trisha. <laughs> you told me right, this is a book. Yeah. Yeah. God, Daphne. Uh, I don't know if the person is here, but there was someone I was talking to uh, recently. I handled Daphne. And like the next day, they were like, I haven't even met her yet, and I'm having nightmares. Oh, no. Awesome. <laughs> Great. You guys are going to love it. <laughs> um, basketball. Basketball yeah. plays a huge role in this book. Why is basketball important to you? I don't know. Maybe because my dad introduced it to me. I don't know. Like, me and my brothers have played in our whole lives with my dad. Um, I'm from Detroit, and in the 80s, the Pistons were amazing, and so were the Celtics, and Lakers. <laughs> we, so were the fucking Celtics. <laughs> and, um, but in Detroit, the Bad boys were like the greatest thing ever. And there was one year where I went with my dad to every single home game that year. So like there's been like a soft spot in that way. And it's a game I just know better. Like I don't know football. Like I love football, like watching it, but I've never played. I would have got like crushed, you know? Yeah. And then like baseball, I was afraid of the ball. So I so, so tennis, I was afraid of the ball. Um, ping pong, I was afraid. <laughs> So uh, basketball, I was like, yeah, yeah, let, let's use. And I tried one a while ago. I tried, uh, like, the first book I ever wrote has, like, a moment, like, a scene with uh, basketball practice and stuff. And I was always looking for, like, an angle, just like I was always looking for an angle like, with anxiety on, in a book. And those all came together with this one. Yeah. I love the, um, so, again, for those of you who haven't read it, it, it opens with Kit Lamb. They're, they're asking the rim a question, and if you make the shot, it's going to come true. And, and I won't, you know, we're not going to, no spoilers. But <laughs> but um, how superstitious are you? Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. Yeah. Uh, I wish Allison was in the studio right now. <laughs> like, I won't let an, uh, if Allison and I walk down the street, if anything comes between us, like anything, I have to say bread and butter to keep our energy together. Unless we were having... A bad time, then then let the thing now intentionally walk by like a you know like a bike a biker sign that's in the you know you walk on that side I walk on this side Let's start this over. Um, there are so many of these yeah. it's like insane, but not like in a OCD way. Yeah. Not <laughs> entirely. And it's more like in a really awesome I'm right way. <laughs> Like I have a copy. I've I haven't read the book. Richard Layman's um, was a big one. Something the uh, Traveling Vampire Show. I've had that book in like the pocket stairwell, whatever it's called, in the uh, door well of the car of ours yeah, yeah, yeah. for like since we bought it. Cause, like I put that in there for the first time we drove it, and I was like, well, nothing bad happened. <laughs> that thing is still, it's in there right now, traveled all the way from Detroit to here. Incredible. And it's so and it gross. And it kept you safe the whole way. Yep. So thank you for that book. <laughs> now I'm afraid to read it, you know, just let me know. I have a great relationship with that book, let's just leave it. We probably have a copy here, we'll just get you a copy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, Alright, you have written a bajillion books, which I know because I own them all. Um, what is your process like, and do you sleep? <clears throat> yeah, Allison doesn't sleep, but I do. Um, <laughs> so it's not like there's no uniformity. Are there? I was a lot. I know Tony. And are there like a lot of writers in the house? Yeah. Can, um, yeah can there's no you. uniformity um, overall, yeah. but there is book to book. Okay. So Bird Box was done. The first session was seven a.m. Well, I woke up at seven. It was eight a.m. to like noon mm -hmm. every day till it was done. Eight a.m. or eight till noon. Uh, the most recent one, Incidents Around the House, was 8 at night till midnight. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, Wendy, my first book, was midnight till 4 a.m. Every session started mm -hmm. at midnight. Um, I don't know what that is, but it seems like once you get it started, uh, for me, once it's started, every day till it's done. I don't care if it's good, bad, right, wrong. I don't want to risk um, 
losing it. Yeah. I don't want to risk like it's slipping through my fingers or something. Yeah, you're So in get get the rough, rough draft done. So like no, it's not like, you know, every day I write from noon to four, <laughs> but yeah. in in and of himself, each of the thirty six books have been uniform in and of themselves. Also the word count. So mm. Bird Box was about forty three hundred um a day. Uh, but the newest one was 2,500. Mm. Um, Mary Carol was 5,300. Oh but I tried one. At, I tried one at 500 because, man, I saw online that um, Paul and someone else, Paul Tremblay and someone else, wrote 500 a day, and I'm like, how the fuck do you only write 500? Yeah, I, I that's couldn't all paragraph. I could. Yes, I know. <laughs> I was like, what? And I wrote him about it. I'm like, you only write 500 words a day? And he was like, oh, you know, I really, you know, I'm very particular. And I'm like, well, I can tell, but still. Yeah, he's a math teacher. So I was like, I was like, right, you know, I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna write 500 a day. It was brutal, but I did it. I did it for the whole thing to see what it was like. It's probably the worst book I ever wrote. It's like a stilted, boring thing. It's like, did it, did it, did it. I would be, the sessions were 15 minutes long. I was, yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's I talked to Paul about that after. I'm like, I'm never fucking doing that again. Yeah. And I, and I was also like, but now you have to do one at 4,000. Oh yeah. <laughs> Jumping from 500 to 4,000. That's like, that's like when you're doing NaNoWriMo and you miss a few days and then all of a yeah, sudden yeah. you're like, oh no! Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I would like to see someone that's like, like a sharpshooter. Yeah. Like, like just, like throw up on the page. Yeah. Like I'm interested in what would come out of you. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's so you forced yourself to stop after 500 words. It was awful. Yeah. That's terrible. Yeah. And then I, I have a, a friend named James. I hope that every writer has a friend named James. No. <laughs> that um, <laughs> that um, we update each other what we're writing every day. So I'll be like, I'm 400, you know, words in today, or blah blah blah. I did this much today. And every day I would write him like, I'm done already. Like, oh God, James, this is awful, you know? And it just, it lasted like three months. Yeah. Yeah. That's insane. Yeah, don't do that again. <laughs> yeah, I'm never gonna do it again. Um, but jumping off of that, do you have, cause there are a few writers in the room. Do you have like advice that you like to give about writing? Yeah, of course. Um, I think for me, it was um, the day, cause you'll hear sort of like these platitudes or something, right? But this one took root with me, which is like, it doesn't matter if the rough draft is good or bad. It just doesn't matter because, yeah. okay, Bird Box got sold to HarperCollins. Mm -hmm. And then I rewrote it from scratch after that. Oh so it's almost like a philosophical question, like what book did they buy, right? Yeah. <laughs> and it's, I wrote from scratch, like from, except for the birth scene. I wrote it from mm -hmm. scratch, like beginning to end. So like what really happened there, right? Yeah, so right. what that says to me is that that rough draft, had enough spirit and energy for it to get, I guess, sold or something. Yeah. But it also wasn't the book in the end, so who cares how right or wrong it was? Mm -hmm. And then once that actually takes root, actually takes root, that you don't, it doesn't matter how good or bad the rough draft is, but then you can do fucking anything. Yeah. Because I'm going to fix it later. Right. The problem with this philosophy, <laughs> brutal rewrites. Oh. Brutal, oh. brutal rewrites. And I had read... Uh, Joe Lansdale was talking about it. He edits as he goes. It's one draft, you know, that he sticks with the whole time. I tried one like that. Well, I tried two. I did Mallory like that and Car Carpenter's Farm, I guess. I guess you can argue with that. Yep. And there's something to me, it's like the rough draft should just be like, just sort of, sort of a joyous, like, I just I want to, I got to get this out. Yeah. I got to get this out. We'll fix it later, blah, 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 blah. Kind of like even this conversation, I'm like, I just want us to like, like we're rapping yeah. rather than having some like pre. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But we could rewrite this conversation later and it would be good. <laughs> I don't wanna. Don't, wanna. <laughs> don't set me up for that. <laughs> the amount of lack of motivation I have for like editing podcast episodes. And I don't even, oh, I don't really? even do that much editing, but it's like, I wait till like 12 hours before it's supposed to go up. Cause I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> so, so I, yeah. Joe knows. Yeah, Joe I, knows. I'm the one laughing. <laughs> Just my co-host, so Joe knows. Um, yeah, no, rewrites sound like true, true terror. Yeah, um, but it's also, but well, hang on though, because it's also you see yourself getting better. Well, that's true. And so like there's a beauty, there's a holy cow beauty to that also, where yeah. it's like every sentence is getting better in the rewrite. So there's like, yeah. while it's like, oh gosh, it's so taxing, but it's also so rewarding. Yeah. But nothing, for me, nothing beats that initial go around. Yeah. And and I recently, okay, uh, Ryan, my um, manager, mm -hmm. and I had a meeting with like a director. 
And the guy was saying like what he's into. And I'm like running through like all the books that are stories that have been published and stuff, you know, in my head and blah, blah, blah. And then I'm like, oh God, I think this guy would like, like a book of mine that I haven't rewritten yet. It's just mm -hmm. in my office. And it, so at some point in the, in the meeting, I was like, hey, Mickey, I, I think you might like this book of mine called Past. And Ryan, you could see Ryan like, what? <laughs> <laughs> like, the hell is this? <laughs> and, uh, and then I was like, uh, you know, blah, blah. And then Mickey was like, um, yeah, send it to me. And I'm like, oh, shoot. What do I do now? <laughs> I, I need to rewrite, rewrite this really fast. <laughs> so I was like, okay, just screw it. Just send it to him. Yeah. And he called me. He loves it. We've been talking about it for a while. He's already written a script for it, whatever. Awesome. The point is the rough draft has had the spirit, yeah. had the scenes, even the film side doesn't need like the exact, they're gonna yeah. change your book anyway. You, yeah. <laughs> right, so to, when you start to like think of the rough draft in those terms, yeah. it's so liberating. I like that. Yeah. I like that. Um, speaking of adaptations a little bit, is it is it weird to have your book adapted? Yeah, I mean, I mean that's it, gotta be weird, right? Yeah, but You're it's like, like I wrote that, but I didn't write that. No, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there is like the side of you that like, I didn't say that, you know. I almost feel like Larry David. I didn't say that, you know. It's like you always want to like yell at someone. It's like, it's, it's like you reverse those two words. It was so much better with one. <laughs> so much more poetic. You totally missed it. Um, Bird Box, the movie, is the greatest thing that's ever happened to me, you know? Yeah. Aside from my kids, I don't have any kids. And so, for me, it's like, like some people ask, like, did you like that movie? I'm like, like that movie, like, changed my life. Like, yeah. yes, I liked it. I don't even know if I, I don't even know if that movie's good or bad or whatever. Yeah. I think playing in a band, and I think we talked about this. Yeah. Playing in a band, um, you know, we've talked about all this. Um, we talk a lot. <laughs> playing in a band, I, I bring the songs to my best friends. I don't tell Derek what to do on the drums. I don't tell Chad what to do on the bass. So it's like the same exact thing. Like I wrote the song Bird Box and Netflix and Sandra Bullock play the music. Yeah. And take it away. And some of the songs, uh, do I think the high strung, some of the songs we went the wrong way? Yeah, who cares? Let's do another one. Mm -hmm. And so same thing like with the movie. Do I feel like some things are wrong? Yeah, but it was amazing. Let's roll. Yeah. 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 Um, I I just so desperately want the Goblin show. That's, it's all I want. That's that. That would be a That's delicate one. So I, I wrote I the uh, pilot episode though. I did. I think I told you. Yeah, yeah. 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 And I've just been sitting on that information in my brain like someday. someday. Yeah. I want to write a sequel to Goblin. Yes. Ooh, really please. A return to Goblin. Let's a return to Goblin with Walter Camp like hugging like a palm tree and his hair blowing in the wind. It returned to God. <laughs> if you guys haven't read Goblin yet, it, it might be my favorite of, of the Melanins. <laughs> so that book that book started as uh, there was a list I had uh, of ten novellas, and I was like, this is gonna be amazing. This is gonna be like a thousand page, you know, in this city. I made it to six, and I just ran out of gas. I was yeah. like, nah, screw it. But what that means is there's four others that are sitting there and have been sitting there for a while. So every now and then I'll eye that list. I'm very excited about this. <laughs> um. Before we open to Q&A, um, what's the thing you're proudest of that you've done? Artistically? Anything. Oh, come on. Anything? <laughs> no, I can't answer that. All right, fine. Artistically. Artistically. Um, mm. I like to put them on the spot. No, that's a great question, though. I feel like more people should be able to answer this, right? Um, Probably the first one, yeah. because it was the... It was like you like this. I had failed at writing a novel four times prior, which only means to me failed only means didn't finish them. Mm -hmm. uh, so to go for it a fifth time, and we're talking over like a decade, yeah. and you're like, I'm gonna get it this time. <laughs> and like you're ten years deep into not getting it. Yeah. Like I think, and then and then to actually make it to page two eighty, and I was in a coffee shop. Oh my god, I was in a coffee shop, and I like stood up. From uh, it was a, it was a coffee shop of all um, uh, law students. Okay. So everyone else there was like totally studying for the bar, <laughs> and I was and this was midnight to four a.m. at this all night place, and I like left out of my chair. I was like, oh my god, oh my god, I know how it ends. I know how it ends. I'm, I'm gonna finish the book right now, Aww. and I was like freaking out, so excited. So I think Wendy would probably be. And there's, I swear, there's not so many proper names books. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why this. They, that, those are just the ones that have come out so far. But anyway, Wendy. Um, yeah, I feel like just that would be the thing that I'm proudest of, and I would say that any writer should be proudest of is that they're 
the voice that was like, you can do it. Because like, no one, you know, no one's necessarily telling you that. Even if, well, that's not true. I know lots of people do tell you that, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm starting to spiral. The next question. Yeah. No, let's uh, <laughs> let's open up to Q and A. Who's got questions? Uh, so how how tempting is it to so when you look at, read a horror book like you look at some of Stephen King's or you, like uh, Justin Cronin's The Passage trilogy. How hard is it not to um, go down that path of just like writing everything that's on your mind? What I notice about your books, they're very tight. Like you get to 300, I can read that book in a couple of weeks and I don't feel like I have to dedicate an entire season to the book. What What is it, is it your style or is it just a temp, do you, is it what you owe to your readers? You're like, I owe them a story that gets to the point. Well, what a, no one has ever asked me that question. Um, so my fiance Allison only reads fantasy like series and stuff, and she read Daphne, and she was like, "That was like a short story." She was like, "That book could have been four times longer." And I'm like, "You read thousand page novels like all the time. That's all you read." She's like, "No, that one can't." And then she's like, "Oh yeah, maybe you're right." Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I think since day one, I've seen them as like episodes of a of a TV series that I'm the host of. Right, so I'm Rod Sterling, and Bird Box was episode one, you know. Um, and I always saw Bird Box as sort of like a black and white episode. I don't know why, but I did. I'm um, Mary Carol was like a, the Western episode. Um, uh, black Man Wheel was, I guess, you could say like an army or or a band or whatever. And I've like always like kind of seen them that way. And I think that for that, um, there's a sense like get to the point or something. So I guess you would say it's style. But then Ghoul in the Cape is crazy. And Ghoul in the that, Cape that, is bigger than I am. Ghoul in the Cape is 300,000 words. Um, I think that at maybe with what you're saying, like there, I had a moment where I was like, hey man, let, let's just see what it's like to throw everything in, you know? And I loved it, I freaking loved it. And I love reading giant books. I just read 11, 22, 63, and it's one of the greatest oh, books I've it? ever read it's in my entire so life. Good. I couldn't even believe it, yeah. And then, um, so I love that kind of thing. But when uh, maybe it's again the band. Uh, I don't want to. I don't. I hesitate to use the word pop song because that makes it. That's like a. I don't know. That's dangerous to say a pop <laughs> album or something. But there is a sense of like like get to it or something. Get to it and then like make the change and and you know e even if it's like a weird book like like let's get to it or something. So I guess it's just style. And Pearl and that eye scared the hell out of me. Awesome. <laughs> I almost spoiled that whole book just now. Okay. Yeah. No, 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 no. Y'all should be Pearl. <laughs> that book was a really hard book to explain to someone. Like, I would be like at the yes. bar, and people would be like, what are you working on now, Josh? And I'm like, oh my god, it's unbelievable. This telepathic, like, pig. And then, like, and then eventually the entire, like, city is in his, like, mental web, but his mental web is, like, sludgy. He's just realizing the power of his, like, that day, and it was like, <laughs> All right. And that I'm was, over here, a bookseller. I'm like, oh yeah, I made it my staff pick. So, um, <laughs> evil telekinetic pig, just trust me. <laughs> that sounds bizarre, but it's not. It's not. No, it's, it's not. great. It's well, great. Thanks. And uh, and I successfully handled it a bunch. So thank you. It worked. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Who else has questions? Influencers. Oh man. <laughs> Well, I mean, I think uh, one of the names on this list is going to probably uh, sound bad, but in, at, for years when I was younger, it was the prolifics like Woody Allen, like Stephen King, like Alfred Hitchcock, like Agatha Christie, like Bob Pollard from Gotta Buy Voices, like people that were putting out um, work like regularly or books or whatever regularly, um, but they each had like their own flavor, their own, it never felt... Like it never felt, it never feels with God of My Voices that they're like um, phoning it in or something. And Hitchcock, each one felt like he like gave us all, and and all those anyone that like operated that way. I think that that more like that approach like thrilled me more than anything else. I was already, you know, in fifth grade trying to write a novel, so to encounter these like artists that had like found a way to. Jesus, do that for 50 years or something, and like two a year or whatever it is, and you make 50, 60 movies, and I started to see it as, um, uh, what's the right phrase? It's not like each book, each book doesn't have to represent you in full. Each movie doesn't ha have to represent Hitchcock in full. It's the body of work that will represent you in the end. 
And that was the biggest influence to me. It was like, because that liberated me to say, well, this story, you know, I don't have to say everything about me in this story. I don't have to say my whole worldview. And if you write enough of them, you can even write a book that you don't agree with at all. <laughs> and I think that, so something in encountering, encountering the like prolifics, like those, anyone in that realm, like, like really, really thrilled me. I was curious about why the title changed for on this yeah, day. Yeah, it was a bad idea. It was my idea. <laughs> it was my idea. I don't know why. Uh, on this day, the pig came out, uh, limited edition, Cemetery Dance, and then a few years later, um, Del Rey asked to put it out wider with Goblin and House Bottom of Lake, and I was like, oh, maybe we should change the title. Like, this is the stupid to the uh, proper name Pearl. <laughs> I have one of the greatest horror titles ever. On this the day of the pig, and I was like, mm, let's change it to, you know. And I, a lot of people online will write like, I like the other time. I'm like, I do too, I know. I know, I made a mistake, all right? It should be on this the day of the pig. And for now on, I'll just call it that. But, but, whatever. Other questions? What's your favorite slasher? Oh, um, I, um, <laughs> I love the burning. Ooh. That you know, okay. you know that yeah, canoe yeah. scene in the burning. That's yep. one of my favorite scenes of all time. But I mean, the first ones I ever saw was Nightmare on Elm Street. Yeah, so, and I, and it was great. We watched me and my friend watched like the first four in one day or something like that. Mm -hmm. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. And again, you know that character. Wow, because yeah, because. He's as elastic as it gets. Yeah. Like anything could happen. He's kind of like Anthony from um, Twilight Zone, the movie. Yeah. And the yeah, yeah, yeah. show. Because it's like literally anything goes. Anything um, Anthony imagines he can do to his family or anyone he like lures into his house or whatever. Even if, if that is even a house. And same thing with Freddy. Like nothing's real. Literally anything goes. And but somehow remains um, tight under this umbrella of like it's a dream. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. versus like extending into like um, absurdism. Yeah. Yeah. So Freddy is a real brilliant, like Wes Craven, like. Oof. I love Freddy. Yeah. I, we're we're due for some some new Freddy, I think. Yeah. Do you have a question? Um, I I think you and I have talked about this before. Actually, I know we have. We, what do you think is the ultimate art form? I know we've talked about this, and why. Yeah. The, will you ever be brave enough to do? It? I don't know. The stand-up comedian. Yep. Is the ultimate art form because you don't have the the uh, drummer to hide behind or to ride. That's not even weird. I'm gonna text Derek after. Hey Derek, how are you? How are you? Um, you don't have the drummer to ride. You don't have the bass player. That's like uh, you know maybe if they don't like you, maybe they'll like the other singer or whatever. You don't have the cinematographer to set the mood. You don't even have the distance of like, I wrote this novel and now you read it when I'm not around. You know, like, the stand-up comedian is alone on stage. Not only that, but like, they're to just make you laugh. Would I ever do that? Whew, if I did it, I would want it to be all like one story. Whether it was three minutes, five minutes, ten minutes, whatever. One story that just kept getting weirder and weirder and hopefully funnier and funnier. Would you do hopefully. it? I've done it. No, I have. Oh, you've not done it, but you I, want it. I want it. Yeah. I have a, a comedy notebook, which is the oh. saddest, dumbest thing. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, that's amazing. Where right? it's like, this is my tight ten, and I'm like, what does that even mean? <laughs> and I saw the marvelous Mrs. Maisel like one too many times, oh, and I'm like, so, I'm gonna do that. It's so good. That's so, amazing. so if you do that, I want, I want, I would love to be there or see it or however you gotta I mean, do it. If you do it. Let's Oof. What God, it's talk about anxiety, man. Yeah. I mean, what about, like, next, next time you have a book launch, we set something up at, like, Hatbox Theater and do, like, uh, for comedy night. What if every, what if every horror, what if everyone here every horror been. author had to do stand-up? Like, like, <laughs> that would be rough. I'm trying to think of the ones that would be good at. Mine right? would involve a pencil in the eye. I didn't already say that. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm going to know the story. Okay. Yeah, I don't know if I could do it. I think that a lot of us would be throwing up backstage. Yeah. And I'm not, I think only a hand Handful of us would actually go through with it. A lot of alcohol. A lot of alcohol. <laughs> Let's see more. What a good question. Any others? Yeah. Okay. I have to know. Are you going to make us disappear? Oh, man. 
Who wants to disappear? <laughs> what? What? Yeah. <laughs> I do, I do. <laughs> That's the best question ever. Thanks. <laughs> Wait, have we been talking for a while already? I think that, uh, how, I have a question. Oh yeah, go for it. So if Daphne was going to be made into a film, who would you want to play Daphne? An actual seven footer. Shaquille O'Neal. Shaquille O'Neal. Or Kareem and <laughs> Robert Perry. Um, no, I, God, what a great question. Because what if I could get like Rebecca Lobo to play? She's pretty, she's not seven feet, but what if I can get Rebecca Lowell to play that? Oh my God. That, that has been um, option. And the writer of Malignant and uh, Megan is, is the Sash writer. And she's unbelievable. Her name's Akela Cooper, and it's the best pitch I've ever, like, I don't really love that word, but it's the best I've ever seen in my life. When we really went to the studios with it, she was so funny and so good I was like, this is going to get picked up. And then it did. She was like incredible. So she's attached to uh, right. Excellent. Yep. Very good news. Yeah. <laughs> I will ask her who she sees in mind. But I, I, I think for sure, like a giant, <clears throat> awesome woman. <laughs> <laughs> like mom. Mom, you play dad. <laughs> You're a giant awesome woman. You always will be. You're only five feet tall. You're still a giant awesome woman to me. Perspective can do marvelous things. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I love that. Any others before we start wrapping up and get to signing? Yeah. I guess that's it. I, I just saw Bird Box the other night, the movie with, with my wife. And just listening today, it sounds like some of your characters or plots are really unique. But do you wind up spending a lot of time developing things and say, oh my gosh, that's that's a complete cliche and out it goes? Or, yeah. yeah. But then I, yeah, I do. But then I worry that uh, you got to be careful that you're not being like far out for far out's sake or something. You know what I mean? Like, like I'll have that. There's that a lot of moments in the office where it's like, are you saying no to this like for the right reasons? And are you saying yes to this for the right reasons? Usually if you're saying yes, you're saying yes for the right reasons. You know, but, but when you're saying no, it could be because you're embarrassed. It could be because you're like, you know, scared that you can't do that. Like, I've had ideas that I'm like, I can't do that fucking research. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> that would be me. I'd be like, I don't want to do that. No, and I'm like, I'm, no, I've had like ideas about like a doctor. I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> no freaking way am I writing about that. No, I got to know everything about that. And then Alice would be like, well, you can just get learn like five or six terms. I'm like, yeah, you're right. Just, like, just throw in like a few, but the other, you know, it doesn't work. So... Yeah, that, that, that stuff does cross my mind. It's like, I'm like, a, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I, I think that that's, but some, some, as you can tell, it makes me almost uneasy to say that or something. Because that's like a real, you're in the office moment and something crosses your mind, you're like, yeah, that's cheesy. Or you'll be like, oh, that's trite or this or that. But then I'll read somebody else do it and I'm like, I wish I did it. <laughs> you know, like a home invasion, you know, like a really good one. You know, and most of them are really good. And I'm, like, I'm like, why don't I write a home invasion? I'm like, I don't know. But, you know, but in the office, I usually say no to myself. What are you working on next? Um, so it's called Incidents Around the House. And it started, or the idea came from like 15 years ago where my brother, his kid is now 18, so he was three. And Ryan was putting, um, Ryan and his wife were putting fins to the bed. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Finn said goodnight and then Alyssa said goodnight Finn and then Finn said goodnight again and then Alyssa said you already said goodnight and Finn said I'm saying goodnight to other mommies nope oh. 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 And Ryan, nope. Ryan told me this story and I was like dude did you what did, what did you do he's like we know what I do I just like we laughed and went back I'm like oh, no what <laughs> like who's other mommy man you know <laughs> like, like, uh, so for like 15 years I've been I tell that story at the bar I'm like oh my god my brother that's the scariest thing I've ever heard and then finally I'm like oh, I'm gonna write that story so I wrote it uh, a couple months ago and the whole thing is narrated by the six year old awesome. which Whoa. that if anyone hi Tom <laughs> oh, yeah. hey, if anyone here has ever um, written uh, a book like from that perspective it's crazy because you can't even say like you have to neuter yourself. So like you can't even say like mom sat beside me on the couch. No kids sat beside me. No. 
You know, mm -hmm. and there might not even be like moms on it or moms on the couch, or mom sat down, or mom sat, or mom, you know, whatever, whatever mm -hmm. it is. Beside me, like, even the littlest thing like that, you're like, when you go through it again, you're like, oh, mm -hmm. no, 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 don't use, don't use it. Even like a precocious kid wouldn't say that. Yeah. So, yeah. It was actually just an excuse to not have to write very well. <laughs> <laughs> spooky children. Man, I mean, you know, I have, I have two spooky children, so yeah. I'm all about... Okay, wait, one more, th one more thing about that, though. One more thing. So, um, the exciting thing about writing that book is that, because anytime I'm watching a haunted house story, it's like, why don't they get, why don't they leave, right? So they do. And so it's called Incidents Around the House, but it's around every house they go to and all the friends' houses. And so, like, almost every scene is is at, you know, friends' homes where they don't tell them what's going on because eventually you're like, can we spend the night? You know? And they all have, like, beards. Well, they all have beards. <laughs> <laughs> the six-year-old has a beard that's under her eyes. Um, that's a funny movie idea. But, but they're like, yeah, so they're like on the, they're on the freaking run. And then eventually it's like, if it's fine, we may as well go back home. Mm -hmm. But back home is where it started, so that mm -hmm. it's uh, sort of a do -do 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 into trying to outrun this haunting. I love that. I um I almost <coughs> I almost decked my five year old recently because I walked into her room and she's she's the spooky kid, and I couldn't find her. She wasn't in her bed. She wasn't she wasn't over by her sister. The room's not that big. I was like, where is this child? And then I saw two little feet poking out from like inside the closet. And, and I like moved the curtain aside and she was like in like the like back of the closet. Oh no. Just. No. <laughs> and then she like no. looked up at me and like mumbled something creepy. No. And I was like, go to bed. <laughs> and I put her in bed and I turned around and my, my two year old who never wakes up quietly. She's like, she wakes up and she wants the world to know that she's awake. And I turned around and she was standing in her crib watching us and I was like. <laughs> you have to burn the house down. I was like, Cordelia, you're too scary. And she was like, sorry, mommy. And I was like, don't do that again. Ugh, these children. Alice always tries to scare me and succeeds. Uh, the, I'll just say like the freakiest one ever was, I've, I've, I've had this like kind of like big old desk that I've had forever. And I never realized how much room there was like under the desk until this day. Well, I, I came into the office and I like, sat down and I like, started like writing and a hand just goes. <laughs> and I mean, I flipped, man. I like, I, I, I had no idea that she was down there. Like I sat down, I didn't like touch her. You know, oh, it was so scary. Yeah. Terrifying. Yeah, I'm real brave when it comes to like reading horror books and watching horror movies, but anything in real life, no, no, thank you. I have an awesome video to send you, another like freaky closet sort of little oh, thing. Oh, good. <laughs> Can't wait. <laughs> um, awesome. Any other things you guys want to want to talk about? This would be great to talk about science and books then. Yeah, it should be. Um, but real fast, I want to thank you for uh, everything you're doing for me and for horror. And it's truly, the whole scene knows about you. And, and we all like talk about you, me and Jans and others talk oh, about you. And shucks. and my brother even called and he's like, are you, are you meeting Ryan tonight, you know? Um, thank you. It's like truly, truly amazing what you're, uh, what you're doing here. people in New England love horror. <laughs> he believes me, sort of. All right, well on that note, we're gonna prove Ryan right. Uh, thank you everybody for coming. If you already have a copy of the book, meet you at the signing table. If you don't have a copy of the book, meet you at the register. Thank you everybody for coming. Thanks, that was awesome. All right. Wow. I'm gonna wish you a signing table. Okay, oh, this is yours. Ready to go?